Okay, come sit down. No. Come on. Okay. Sit down. No. I want to. I want you to see if you think you're trying. No, I don't want you to videotape me. Okay, come on. You're having a temper tantrum now. We have three. Natalie is the oldest, and she's 22. Erica is the middle child, every definition of a middle child. And then there's Colin, who's the youngest. Natalie, in first grade, read A Tale of Two Cities. And I did everything exactly the same for Natalie and Erica. And I just knew there was something a little different. She understood everything, but she didn't really talk. So she would get frustrated a lot. When Erica would come home from school, you know, parents, we want them to do their homework right away so they can do their other things. But Erica would be very resistant and she would really get upset. And she would say things like her hands hurt, her head hurt. And we always thought it was just like, she just doesn't want to do it. She wants to go outside and play. When you look at a kid that looks normal, you just think it's got to be lack of trying. My other daughter was a voracious reader. My husband's an attorney, I'm an epidemiologist. We had no reason to think that she had a learning disability. I just feel like something else is going on. And everyone in the school was like, oh no, 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 you know, just give her time, give her the gift of time. And so we did, in fact, we repeated kindergarten. We did it twice, hoping that the gift of time would really help her. What it was, because we did not know her diagnosis, she had dysgraphia, dyscalculia, and then the dyslexia. I begged the school to assess her, but the problem was at the school, the only services they had were for speech and language delay. They'd pull her out of the classroom for a couple hours and just sit with her like, th, 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 you know, working out sounds, but really that wasn't her problem. They really didn't have the expertise to properly diagnose dyslexia or to even help a kid with that type of auditory or visual processing problem like dyslexia. The biggest thing is my school, they basically told me they didn't know how to help me. Like they always put me in the back with a, a box of crayons and said, here, do this, why I teach the kids. And it was really hard. So my parents were not happy and they wanted change and so did I. Erica was struggling in school and she came here in the middle of third grade with difficulty with reading, writing, spelling, and math. The mission of the Prentice School is to serve students in grades kindergarten through eighth grade who have a learning difference. They struggle to learn to read, to comprehend what they're reading, they have attentional issues, they need a different learning environment and we're here to provide that for them so that they feel successful, they're capable, they're productive human beings, citizens, and students. We have a lot of kids that come in here um, with lack of self-confidence, unhappy in school, and then once they get here, it's a very small classroom, there's a lot of student-teacher interaction, and um, they just thrive, their self-confidence goes up. Our teachers teach us in a way so we can understand. It's called the slang approach of teaching. We use our eyes, ears, and our hands all at the same time to learn. If you give me a book, on the paper, I can see it like how you guys see it. It's actually how my brain sees it. So my brain sees like the B backwards, the P backwards, letters flipped. It literally looks like bouncing letters for me. Now how singing worked is there's a right side and a left side of the brain. The right side is the more creative part and the left side is the more math, reading, STEM, that stuff. And there was a research found that like people like me, I'm left-handed and I'm pretty much all right-handed brain, that if I flip the signals, so singing is a creative part. So if if I flip it, it wouldn't be my left side of my brain, it would be my right side. So my teacher told me to sing. I started singing and I could actually sing the words. And by that, I was reading. I wasn't reading a chapter book. I'm just saying I was able to read a phrase and that was so big for me. I was I was dancing on a table. My, my classmates were dancing on a table just because I could read a, a line from Who Spilled the Milk, which is a children's book. If you like hitting things, and if you like stealing things, and if you, if you like running, and um, a team atmosphere with uh, individual achievement, it, it is, uh, you know, something that is 
uh, American-esque um, and very unique. Uh, it, it typically, once you get brick dust in your blood, you, you, you tend to stay on the field. When I was younger, I was always in dance, gymnastics, you know, those every mom wants their daughter in the sports. And then when I started to get, when I wanted to choose a sports, I wanted to do, like, I wanted to do football. Like, I wanted to play soccer. I was, I would say I like to get my aggressiveness out. And actually, like, I wasn't planning on playing softball. I was actually thinking about continuing a career in gymnastics because I was short, flexible, and had a lot of power but it was when my sister tried out. Erica gets one look at the crazy socks and the big hair bows that go, and she started screaming, I wanna play, I'm faster, I'm the fastest, I'm the fastest girl in the school, I can throw harder than anybody, I wanna play. And there's a coach in the parking lot who says, I'll take her. She was dyslexic, and to deal with that, we used pick-proof signs. But in her case, we used a simplified aspect. It worked real well. She, she never missed a sign. She was always where she needed to be, when she needed to be. Erica was too old to play for my team, but I knew that I wanted her to be in my organization. So we wind up, we're competing against them. I saw her out in center field. And man, I just think she's like the, the little little train that could, you know, because man, she's, she's not the biggest kid, but man, just her overall energy levels and her effort is amazing. I think a lot of them come in that they've been labeled and therefore it's hard sometimes for them to get past that. Um, Eric had no problem and she kind of wore it as a badge and it definitely did not define her. Uh, if anything, it made her even stronger and better. So I have a sign in my office and it says, being unique is better than being perfect. And she definitely took that to, to what it was supposed to be. At that point, we were so focused on the dyslexia that we didn't know that she also had ADHD. It was freshman year. It was really that year when they noticed I could not pay attention to save my life. Like I had to run to the bathroom every 10 minutes. I had to draw or something and that really decreased my GPA. I wasn't able to pay attention to English because I would leave for half of the lecture to go to the bathroom because I just couldn't pay attention. Um, sign language, I would, I would leave. So I would miss a lot of material in the class. And it's when I came to my parents and I'm like, mom, like I'm not just being a spaz. I can't pay attention. She goes, it takes me so much energy to sit still in my seat. I learn nothing because all I'm doing is trying to sit still. And at that point, I thought, oh my gosh, we're dealing with something else here that's not normal, and I just felt terrible. So we went in to talk with her teachers and an educational specialist at the school, and she explained to us that um, she really felt that we should get Erica tested for ADHD. The medication helped me so much. I finished freshman year with a 2.8, and I ended up graduating high school with a 3.87. That was just from the medicine alone, allowing me just to relax and focus and learn the material and let it go through my brain and understand it versus it being like this, Meh. One of the things is, you know, she needed a little bit more time to write things down and, and just her attitude about it though. You know, she would be like, okay, I got this problem, I got, you know, I got this problem, I got this problem. And she would be in such a jovial mood about it when she would tell you about her problems that I credit that to her family. They have never like went out of their way to, to felt like she was different or this, that, and the other. And I think that's why she's adjusted so well to this game and having a disability. So, you know, we'd be in the room and we would do chalk talk about hitting before we start. And man, she would have her iPad and she would, started realizing that it was better for her to record everything than try to write everything down. So I think that even became more of a fluid transition for her to, to grow as a hitter and a player. I think she kind of really embraced who she was and really didn't mind the fact that she did have these learning challenges 
In fact, I would ask her to speak to other students and in regards to their learning differences. And uh, for one thing, Erica never used it as an excuse. Erica was one who often thought outside the box. She was very proactive and that took her very far. She was willing to go out and ask questions and not kind of hide behind these learning differences, but more go towards um, to find out what she needed to do in order to conquer them. Believe you have it in you. There are gonna, there's a little phrase I like to tell myself when times get hard, and it's, it's called, it's a mindset. And that's totally right. Think positive and keep your head up high because you are unstoppable. Yes, there are gonna be times when you feel like you're drowning, but a little fishy told me one day to just keep swimming, Dory. And remember, you all are a smart cookie. Thank you. There were talks we had like, what are we gonna do? I mean, is she, how is she gonna go to high school and, you know, do, you know, because we had the older daughter, Natalie, so we already know what, what's to be expected. You know, the homework, the testing, the, the competitiveness uh, of getting grades. And we're like, how is Erica ever going to be able to do that? And we just did not think you know, in our wildest dreams, like, oh, what are we going to do? But really, that was because we were naive. Because she, it's not that she's not smart. It's just that she learns differently. Coach Jay had told her, Erica, you know, they have this merit scholarship that out-of-state students can get, but you have to get this certain level on the ACT. Now, an ACT for someone with dyslexia is like sitting in a room full of snakes, right? It would be your worst nightmare. So they told her she had to get at least a 24 on the ACT. So the first time she took it, she got a 13. And she was so determined. She's like, I'm gonna get that merit scholarship. I am gonna get it. That kid got a 24 on the ACT. Lastly, I would like to thank my parents. Big shout out to Dave. Um, he drove me to Kenny lessons on his birthday. So if you wanna talk about being committed, he is committed, and I thank you so much, Dad. And that's the reason why I'm going to Michigan State, is because he's from Michigan, and I want to represent him and his home state. I get a lot of support here. The Smith Center, great. I'm also registered with the RCPD, and I get my visa there, which is my accommodation, so I get my test read to me. I get a note taker. So I get all the combinations from an IEP, basically. And that really helps me too. But now that I became older and I can advocate, it's really how you talk to your professors. Because there are people here that want to help you. They are trained to help you. They have a degree to help you. So it's really on you and becoming older where advocating becomes so important. And that's why I feel like I'm so successful because I learned how to advocate and know that what I need is right and I'm not embarrassed to ask for it. I was figuring out how was this was going to work out for her in college, you know, with the big classrooms, all those things. And she says she's doing very well in school and, and she's excelling on the softball diamond. So as I say, man, she just, if there's going to be someone who is going to uh, be able to lead a cause or bring a cause to the forefront of, of a D1 athlete, it would be her. I didn't ever think I was going to be able to read, honestly. I, I just gave up. I was like, oh, there's audiobook, you know. But when I first learned how to read, that was probably the biggest thing in my life because it taught me that, hey, I can do this. I can get over this hurdle. I can get over this bump, and I can do this. Betting seven. In center field, number 12, Erica Holt. Betting I think it's important for me 22. to share my story because there are a lot of kids that give up. A lot of kids not getting their GED that struggled in school because they just thought they were stupid and they gave up. And the big thing is they're, they're so talented. Like we have so much to offer to the world. And just because we don't really learn and fit in this little box of common core or something, doesn't mean we can't impact the world. And that was one really big thing for me was kids like have potential and I just want them to be able to maybe pursue a career and not give up because you have to make grades to come to college. Because a lot of people are like, school's ain't for me. You don't know that. School could be for you. You just got to learn in your own way and embrace it. So that was my big impact that like telling kids that struggle, that they can do it. There is a way they're going to learn. If there's a will, there is a way. <laughs>